you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you being here, and thank you for coming by, because without you, we could not do it at all. We couldn't do anything. Uh, we just sit around and just look at the wall, which is pretty much Fridays around here. Anyway, guys, uh, we have an amazing show for you today. We are going to be talking about Picasso. You may have heard from him uh, or heard of him. I don't know. Maybe you've heard from him. Maybe you're one of his lovers. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, she's the author of the newest book that just came out. Jean Mackin uh, has her book out called Picasso's Lovers. Mm, we're going to get into some interesting, tangled, vivid portrait of women caught in Picasso's charismatic, charismatic orbit. Clearly, I flunked uh, English. Before you do... We want to remind you once again, please refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to iTunes. Give us the five-star reviews over there. We really appreciate it. Uh, you know, uh, we talk about how you guys, when you come to the show for the last 15 years, you you get to listen to CEOs, billionaires, White House advisors, Pulitzer Prize winners, Congress members, governors, U.S. ambassadors, astronauts, uh, all the top journalists in the world come by and say hello. You guys join an elite crowd, and I hope you know that, where you guys get to bask in what we call the Chris Voss Show Glow, where there's this wealth of knowledge that's dispersed unto you in this concentrated form by these brilliant minds we have on the show. And uh, we're thinking about calling uh, the, peop the people that uh, bask in the Chris Voss Show Glow our listeners, if you will, you know, because like Taylor Swift has her thing and I don't know, some other people have their thing for their fan. We're thinking about calling the uh, people who bask in the Chris Voss show glow, the Globites or the Globies or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's not going to work. <laughs> Write me and tell me. I don't care. Uh, go to Facebook.com. Um, Chris Voss, uh, Facebook.com. Uh, go to uh, LinkedIn.com uh, forward slash Chris Voss, YouTube.com forward slash Chris Voss, and all those places. You know where we're at, Goodreads.com. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, we're going to get into her book, Picasso's Lover, uh, by Jean Mackin. And uh, it's going to be pretty cool, some of the details that are in here. Uh, she is the author of eight historical novels, uh, the most recent one we just mentioned, coming out on Penguin Random House in January 2024. So this one's up for pre-order, and you can get it now uh, pre-ordered so that you can have it as soon as it comes off the presses. Other subjects for fiction have included Eleanor of Aquaintain? Aquaintain. Aquitaine. I think uh, Jethro Tull did a song about that uh, in the 70s. <laughs> was that? Oh, oh, that was Aqualung. Oh, I'm sorry. I got that wrong. I didn't. Uh, Marie Antoinette and Maggie Fox, founder of American Spiritualism. Now that song is stuck in my head. Uh, Jean was the recipient of Creative Writing Fellowship from the American uh, Antiquarian Society. Well, there's a lot of anti-Aquarian stuff going on here. Uh, her advocacy-based journalism received awards from the Council of Advancement and Support of Education in Washington, D.C. She taught creative writing and mentored non-traditional students, which I must be one. She lives in the Finger Lakes re region of New York State. Welcome to the show, Jean. How are you? I'm fine, and thank you so much for inviting me. There you go. You'll never be able to think of your title of your book about Eleanor of Aquitaine without thinking of Aqualung. Sorry, my bad. Uh, so give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the internet? Uh, I have a website. It's uh, jeanmackin.com, J E A N N E M A C K I N.com. There you I'm go. On, I'm on Twitter. I have an author space on Pagebook. On oh. Facebook, sorry. <laughs> Facebook page book. Somebody should make something called page book. That sounds like yeah. a website. That's probably something going on. And of course, Goodreads. Uh, so uh, give us a 30,000 overview. Picasso's Lover. Well, it's Picasso's Lovers. The title is uh, a reference to a, a painting that he made. And the mm -hmm. model is kind of, you know, is it this woman? Is it that woman? I wanted to play with it a little bit. Ah. But mostly I wanted to think about Pablo Picasso. I mean, you think of the 20th century, you think of art, you think of Pablo Picasso. So there were two, mm -hmm. two 
facets of him that I wanted to research, read about, think about. And one is that, was he the greatest artist of the 20th century? Mm -hmm. And was he as cruel to woman as his reputation says he was? So, I know, I know. So, you know, I spent a lot of research and time thinking about that. And mm -hmm. I actually came to the conclusion that, yes, actually, I do believe he was the greatest artist of the 20th mm -hmm. century. You look at his body of, of work, 20,000 pieces, you know, involving four or five different eras and styles of work, mm -hmm. different medium, everything from paper to ceramic to paint to metal. I mean, he could do anything. And I know there were artists, American artists in the 1950s who were still kind of complaining about him because they couldn't do anything that Picasso hadn't already done. Mm -hmm. He, he just covered the territory. And his reputation with women, it, it, it was, that was complicated. I mean, I wrote a first draft. because I don't write from outline. I write instinctively, organically, because for me, it's a journey. It's an adventure. If I know where it's going to end, I don't want to write the book. You know, I want to find out, too. Oh. By the end of the first draft, I realized I had written about the three women who left Picasso, not vice versa. Ah. So now, was this to, historical or fiction? Or uh, the, the woman, um, the three women are historical. Okay. I always incorporate a fictional narrator in with historical figures. Mm. Because as a historical novelist, I don't like to play fast and loose with facts. I kind of stick to the groundwork and what we know and what is verifiable. So mm. I incorporate fictional characters to you know, make room for the imagination, the what if situations. But, you know, a bottom line to me was that I think he gets a bad rep when it comes to women. Uh -oh. and, and I think people are, are starting to reconsider that. I mean, yeah, he had a lot of mistresses. He, he was not known for fidelity, but it was the 1920s, the 30s and the 40s. And, by, you know, <laughs> who was aside from my parents, right? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Except everyone's sister is a virgin. Well, everyone was faithful except Pablo Picasso. I don't think so. He he was <laughs> wild, but but you know, yeah, he was an artist, and he was in Paris. Mm -hmm. It was between the wars, and they partied heavily. So there you go. Yeah. And where is the most of the book set in? What area of the world? Uh, in southern France, because uh, mm -hmm. one of the characters is Sarah Murphy, who mm -hmm. is an American socialite, historical character. And she's the one who actually made the Riviera popular. It's a summer vacation spot. Before mm -hmm. that, people from Paris and the north would go down to the Riviera for the winter for a mm -hmm. vacation. No one was there over the summer. And Sarah Murphy kind of started, and her husband Gerald was an artist, kind of started this trend of, spending the summer on the Riviera. They started the trend of sunbathing, which was not popular before them. So I wanted, and Sarah was one of the women involved with Pablo, with, mm. with my Picasso. So yeah, it's mostly in Southern France. There's, there's a second timeline with a young woman in 1953, um, you know, 30 years after the original story in the structure, who is in New York City. So that's a little part of it too. But she ends up going to the sub, south of France to, uh, to to track things down. There you go. And is is uh, do we find out if he's also a great lover as much as he is a, a great <laughs> painter, artist? <laughs> well, my father was always bitching. I don't do bedroom scenes. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm assuming he was the woman he had that, you know, they adored him. And even mm. when the affair ended, they tended to stay friends for life. So oh. in addition to charisma, I think he was capable of, of, <laughs> excuse me, good sex and deep friendship. There you go. Well, you know, artists are always into the spiritual uh, and all that stuff. And they're all, you know, uh, they're always doing stuff. It's interesting. Um, you know, they're not caught up in the day to day. They're kind of, they get to explore and delve themselves into life. So I, I, how did you flesh out the characters uh, uh, and study up for, uh, I mean, did you try and follow Picasso as his true nature of who he was, or did you embellish it all? Well, I, you know, I tried to stick as close to Pablo Picasso as a historical figure as I could. Um, mm -hmm. 
I read a lot of biographies. I mean, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of biographies about him. And from different points of view, you know, from women who left him, from women who wished he hadn't left them, from his relatives, from his children. So I kind of put it all together and, into a, a mishmash. I think kind of what happened towards the end of his life when he started to get this rep for being aloof and maybe even a little cruel, he was with his second wife, Jacqueline Roke, who was really possessive mm. and protective of him. And she would turn people away who wanted to see him. And I think that might wow. have been the start of his, his kind of aloof, go away, don't touch me reputation. Oh, wow. Well, you know, I, she probably she probably knew about all the other lovers. Oh, yeah, she know, did. I anybody getting near this guy. And yeah. he's mine now. There you go. Yeah. Uh, jealousy will always, uh, jealousy uh, is always a great little tool. Uh, so there you go. Uh, and, and so you paint this luxurious picture of the French Riviera in 1923, very romantic, uh, and um, the different things that he does and how he does them. Uh, what do you think readers are going to come away with uh, that might surprise them or or uh, really intrigue them? I, I would like readers to think again about what exploitation and coercion really is in sexual politics and mm -hmm. what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, I was very concerned with that. Um, mm -hmm. There is such a broad distance between actual rape and seduction. Mm. And I think we need to keep that in mind that they so much are not the same thing. And, you know, mm. Picasso was a seducer, but I never read him as exploitive or mm. even predatory. Uh, he could be actually quite gentlemanly, I thought. That's my take of him. Mm. Keep in mind, I'm a novelist, not a historian <laughs> or a biographer, right? So I, I insert my own take into these things. But I, I would like, you know, a lot of the book is about sexual politics and yeah. what they actually are. And that's one of the things I would like people to, you know, to take away from and to think about and mm. and and to realize, too, the depth of Picasso's work. I mean, I know I have a friend who took her mother to see a Picasso and it was his Cubist period, which is very brutal. And the woman said, boy, he really hated women. But what you need to look at is his neoclassical work, which is very real. You know, it's representational, it's voluptuous, it's loving, it's affectionate. So there's this huge breadth of his work that, you know, I would like people to reconsider if they, you know, I, I always say Picasso, he's the artist that people love to hate or mm -hmm. hate to love. <laughs> he said to love her. You know, I mean, women chase guys who are famous. And if they've got money, I mean, that just adds to it. Usually fame and money go together, I suppose. Uh, and, and, you know, women will throw themselves at, at famous men. Uh, that's just the way it is. Women are hypergamous. They, they date upward. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it's not like he probably had to do a lot to get these women interested in him. You know, he's, he's a fairly good looking guy and, uh, you know, he makes fame and money and, you know, I've, I've, I've hung out with very good looking men, uh, that had some fame, but they were just incredibly good looking and, uh, you know, they had that James Bond sort of look <laughs> and standing near to them. I mean, it was just. To, to hang out with them was just panties and, and underwear bras going past our heads 24 7. I mean, it's just a lawyer like that. women throwing themselves at, at, at him from every turn. Uh, and I mean, he was good looking enough where I'd be like, yeah, if I was, if I was uh, maybe not straight, I would. Uh, he's a good looking man. I mean, you know, I would have to admit to it. Um, but, uh, uh, and women just adored him. And, and he didn't have to do anything. Uh, but you know, just women would just flock to him. You just, you just be like, "Hey, I'm talking to him. Can you wait?" <laughs> There's a I line over there. like that. It was kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this, this is where it goes. So I, you know, maybe maybe that's part of the element of Picasso. Is I mean, he really did. I mean, when you're famous, man, women come to you. Uh, you don't you don't have to do a lot of seduction. Uh, you know, they're well, kind he, of seduced by your famous. He had more than fame, though, and more than looks. There was a real mm -hmm. charisma there. Like yeah. one, of, one of his early lovers, one of his long-term lovers who became a lifelong friend was Marie Theresa Mayer. Mm -hmm. She had never heard of him when they first met. Ah. He had to take her to a bookstore and say, look, there's a monograph <laughs> of my work. Look, famous. You know? So it was more than woman chasing fame. And yeah. he himself was discriminatory. He was not, you know, out for any skirt that would walk by. He, ah. 
he was looking for an interesting face, uh, not necessarily a beautiful face, but something that he could work with as an artist. So that was always a large part of it. So it, I, I, it's not that he was, I think, discriminately promiscuous, that the woman kind of threw themselves at him the way they do with rock stars or anything like mm -hmm. that. I think there were, I think there were real relationships going on there. Yeah. And and uh, they inspired a lot of his art, I guess, too. Do you, I guess, uh, talk about that in the book, play it out in the book, the inspiration to his art and what he created? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I think, I don't know if it's a strength or a weakness, but I don't think Pablo Picasso could differentiate between loving a woman and wanting to paint her. I think mm -hmm. to him they were the same thing. And, and, you know, his, his second wife, Jacqueline, he painted her dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Mm -hmm. um, and with most of his, his women, he, he did the same. There are whole eras of his work that are dedicated to certain women, um, to Francois Gillot, who just died in June. Lots and lots of portraits of her. Um, and very nice ones. She called him, she, he called her the flower woman. So mm -hmm. she was all often painted as a flower or with flowers involved with her because she's so lovely. Uh, Marie Theresa was the soft, voluptuous woman. And he sometimes painted her as a bowl of fruit. <laughs> Which, you know, I was thinking about that. I went back to the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, you know, which mm -hmm. is a totally erotic poem in the Bible. And yeah, women and men, you know, their bodies yeah. are fruit to their lovers. So that's true. Uh, you know, I've some, I've had some women drive me bananas. Oh, <laughs> the uh, I'm looking at some of his work. You know, some of his I I, I don't know. He, he might have needed his glasses checked though. He sometimes yeah. has the boobs in all the wrong places. I, don't know okay. I have there, a theory but... about that. And one reason yeah. why I love his work is that, you know, I think that one of our weaknesses as, as human beings is that we are linear and we think of time as linear. Uh -huh. That doesn't mean that time is linear. It's just the way we perceive it. Oh. And I think a lot of Pablo Picasso's work is outside of linear time. You have the same woman, but in this position and then in that position, it's like he compresses time and shows the same person in different stages of time. And Almost then, like motion, I guess. And, and emotion. And, you know, there's that famous portrait he did of Gertrude Stein. Mm -hmm. um, and he showed it to her and she said, I don't like it. It doesn't look like me. And he told her, well, you will look like it. And he was right. So he, in terms of time, a lot of his work is visionary and nonlinear. And that's why it, it has kind of these things out of place. And, because he's seeing different angles simultaneously. I really believe huh. that. I'm looking at his artwork right now online, and I can see that now. Huh. Thanks for explaining it to me. Now, now, now things are starting to make sense. At first, I was like, yeah, that's not where the boobs go. Um, <laughs> You know, I was lucky enough when I grew up where uh, I uh, grew up in a religious cult that taught me that, you know, sex is evil and bad and shameful and nude bodies are shameful. And and um, a guy's lawn that I used to mow, his first name was Art. I forget his last name. Um, but uh, he was an artist, kind of like it wasn't, you know, big like Picasso, but he was he worked mostly with uh, he did some painting, but he mostly worked with clay. And he would have women come model for him at his studio, this beautiful studio in, in California at the block from us. And uh, the, the whole house set like some sort of Hollywood mansion at the time and the beautiful yards and stuff. And and so I would go to his house and, and you know, after mowing his lawn and wander through his thing and I'd be like, oh, this, there's some naked sculpture women there. That's bad. And he recognized, you know, what I'd been taught and, and he said and told me, he goes, no, the female body is beautiful. It's, you know, look at the lines and the, you know, and, and he really kind of helped me see a different world of what I've been taught and, and appreciate art and the beauty of women, um, the beauty of the body too. But he mostly, he mostly did uh, clay, you know, these, these huge things of women and clay where he would carve it and all that stuff. And uh, so, you know, I learned a lot about art and I learned about artistry and uh and artists, they just have this, they just have a real cool vibe in the world. They do. I mean, one reason I like to write about artists is because I am not a visual person. I'm so verbal that sometimes I dream all in words with no images. Really? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I a lot of reading when you're trying to sleep. <laughs> 
So I, you know, I try to I try to perceive the world the way artists do because for me it's a whole different world. It's a foreign country, and I so admire you know how they were able to to translate what they see into something that that's a work of art and and share that vision with other people but you know i grew up irish catholic i had 12 years of catholic education oh, so i wow. had a lot to overcome <laughs> you you feel my pain i uh, now share your pain there you go there you go so uh what's in uh, holding in the future for you is there anything else you're working on as well uh, I'm starting to work on something new, but I'm superstitious about that until oh. I have the first draft done. I don't, kind of don't talk about it. Oh, I go. think you can talk the energy out of a project if you talk about it too soon. Ah, there you go. Yeah. You don't want to get too far ahead of yourself down the road, too. Right. Uh, so you wrote uh, the last collection, uh, A Lady in a, of a Good Family. And the beautiful American, I think, boy, that last collection cover looks good. We must have asked to have you on the show back in 2020, and maybe we didn't get you booked because that cover looks so familiar to me. Um, that <laughs> well, we I apologize if I missed something. Oh, it's probably you know the the, the big the big publishing houses they they love to lose their emails but they're they're really great though they book uh, so many great people and sometimes if we we've learned if we don't if we don't get in at just the right time before the book launch then we kind of miss all the bookings because you guys you guys are busy with all the stuff you do but the last collection are you are you think you're gonna stick with a theme of uh historical fiction then i i think so i mean i I wrote a lot of journalism when I was working as a journalist, but it was short pieces. And, you know, I've tried to work on nonfiction and it's not where my, my mind goes. I am yeah. by nature, a liar. <laughs> I see a situation right. and I start to make up stories about it. My mm -hmm. mind goes to the imaginative rather than the factual. So yeah, yeah I'm sticking with history. You're a storyteller. That's what I, you're I am a storyteller. Story. Absolutely. You weave, you weave stories and magic into the the form of text. I don't know why I got poetic there, but it sounded really good in my head at the time. It came out well. Uh, there you go. So every now and then I get stuff right, even though I flunked second grade. Uh, so, Gene, uh, anything more you want to tease out uh, or uh, as we go out and uh, give people a final pitch on the book to order it up? Uh, well, the name of the book is Picasso's Lovers. Uh, it's available now for pre-order. It's coming out officially on January 23rd. So please, please run, don't walk. Get my book. Support your local writer. There you go. Support your local writer, folks. Writer books and, and amazing stories. The cover's pretty hot, too. I got There's even one nipple of uh, Picasso on it. So that's that's all the more reason if you're, uh, I don't know, people who like hot people on on, on the French Riviera photos. It's a beautiful cover, actually. It's what I'm a trying hot to say. Cover. There you go. Uh, give us your dot coms, Gene, so that people uh, can find you on the interwebs. So it's www.genemackin.com. J E A N N E M A C K I N. There you go. Thank you very much, Gene, for being on the show. It's been fun. And please come back for the next one. Thank you. I would be delighted. There you go. Maybe it could be uh, Picasso's uh, other lovers or more <laughs> lovers or. Uh, the sequel we can get the other nipple on picasso on this on the cover all right so thank you to my audience for tuning in we certainly appreciate you guys as well go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss youtube.com for chess chris foss chris foss one of the TikTokity, uh and what is it uh chris foss facebook the new thing there you can talk to the show on facebook thanks for tuning in be good to each other stay safe and we'll see you guys next time